Washington headquarters, here's David Franklin. Agonizing to everyone, the search for the facts on why the shuttle Challenger exploded and killed seven people. A commission appointed to find these facts says, through its chairman, the space agency neglected good judgment and common sense. And he said NASA's decision-making process is clearly flawed. Says NASA in response, it is too early to make that judgment. We don't yet have all the facts. So what do we know at this point? We'll ask today's guests. Senator Ernest Holling, South Carolina, of the Senate Science, Commerce, and Transportation Committee. Senator Jake Garn, Utah, chairman of a subcommittee on space budgets. Joseph P. Allen, former shuttle astronaut and now executive vice president of Space Industries. John Yardley, formerly associate administrator of the Space Agency. Some background on this search for answers from our man Jack Smith. And our discussion here with George Will, Sam Donaldson, and Tom Wicker, all here on our Sunday program. Too big to make in one piece, and so they're made in sections. Where the sections are joined, it is impossible to get a tight, perfect seal between two huge pieces of metal. And so they put flexible seals called O-rings between the sections to fill in any cracks that may occur. A lot of evidence now suggests that one of these rings failed, melted perhaps, and allowed fires to shoot out sidewise through the crack. A commission appointed by President Reagan has been investigating this and other questions all week. Before we talk to our guests, some background on this from Jack Smith. Jack? Commission, come to order, please. David, it was the only show in town, if not in the country this week. And the President's Commission on the Shuttle Disaster saw its best evidence yet of what may have occurred. Photographs of the shuttle showing a puff of black smoke from the suspect right booster rocket at the moment of launch itself. We feel that uh, that's a leak, may or may not be related to temperature, and we feel it's coming out of the, uh, the most likely spot is the uh, joint between the air booster and the, and the air segment. It's widely believed now that a seal gave way in a joint in one of the rocket boosters and that this caused the plume of white hot exhaust gas later in flight, which apparently touched off the explosion that destroyed Challenger and its crew of seven. It was originally seen exclusively as a case of equipment failure. But this week's hearings revealed a failure in human communications as well. NASA, it turns out, knew for years the seals were flawed, and the night before launch, warnings the shuttle could explode were disregarded. Monday, January 27th, a scheduled launch is aborted because of bad weather. The temperature turns cold, so cold that that night, foot-long icicles begin forming on the pad. Engineers at Morton Thiokol, which manufactures the boosters, call a teleconference and unanimously recommend against launch the next day. I uh, made the direct statement that if anything happened to this launch, uh, tell them I sure wouldn't want to be the person that had to stand in front of a board of inquiry to explain why I launched this outside of the uh, qualification of the solid rocket motor. There was never one positive pro-launch statement ever made by anybody. On previous flights, Thiokol engineers had noticed that in cold weather, the two rubber O-rings used to seal the booster's joints tended to fail. With launch temperatures predicted in the 30s, 20 degrees colder than ever experienced, they feared a leak and an explosion. But NASA managers in the east strongly objected, and after a heated debate lasting much of the evening, Thiokol management in Utah overruled its engineers, and Thiokol Vice President Joe Kilminster sent NASA the authorization to launch. As for NASA, it denied using pressure, but the commission was still baffled. Did any of you gentlemen uh, prior to launch know about the objections of Thiokol to the launch? I did not. Senior no, NASA officials were never told. Mr. Reinhardt, are you telling us that you, in fact, are the person who made the decision not to escalate this to a level two item? That's correct, sir. If this were an airplane, an airliner, and I just had a two-hour argument with Boeing on whether the wing was going to fall off or not, I think I'd tell the pilot, at least mention it. I had none of the knowledge of any dissension that was going on within the internal discussion at Thiokol. 
None of that was available. The hearings revealed that problems with the O-ring seals should have been well known. As recently as last July, engineers at Thiokol had written warnings to their superiors. We stand in jeopardy of losing a flight along with all the launch pad facilities. Now, was any uh, warning or flavor of that very serious letter transmitted to anyone at NASA, uh, to your knowledge? No, sir. Not, not that letter. I had never considered the SEALs as uh, a threat to flight safety because I thought adequate margin was available. Yet, NASA itself, in this report three years ago, concluded the SEALs were weak and could cause loss of mission, vehicle, and crew. The commission also learned that a second contractor had objected to launch. Icing on the pad was so severe that Rockwell, which makes the orbiter, feared damage to the shuttle from debris during ignition. But this is what happened to Rockwell's views as they were passed down the line. I then called my two program managers who were in Florida at 545. And I said, we cannot recommend launching from here. I said that Rockwell could not assure uh, the safety of flight. My interpretation of the input that was made to me in the mission management team meeting that I described uh, is that a concern was voiced and it was not an objection to launch. Does everybody know what everybody else is recommending? Uh, does everybody have the facts? Clearly not. But since NASA's own ICE team later cleared the launch, it was a moot point. However, it was more evidence that something was wrong. You'll remember that I did say at one point that we thought the decision-making process may be flawed. I believe I'm speaking for the whole commission when I say that we think it is flawed. But as the commission members adjourned for the week, the NASA managers whose testimony had so disturbed them seemed wholly unrepentant. I'm not sure what uh, Mr. Rogers means in terms of the decision process being flawed. Uh, I do not believe that the decision process that I know and understand to be flawed. I know that the decisions that I made based on the data that we had up to January the 27th and through the launch count up until the uh, liftoff occurred on January 28th that all the actions were proper. We thought that the problem was acceptable and did not endanger the safety of flight. NASA Administrator James Beggs resigned this week, though for reasons unrelated to the shuttle disaster. With faith in NASA's infallibility now diminished, if not extinct, the Commission may conclude that some redesigning is required, not only on the shuttle, but on NASA's hierarchy, too. David? Jack, thank you. Coming next, Joseph Allen, a former shuttle astronaut and now executive vice president of Space Industries, and John Yardley, formerly associate administrator of the Space Agency, and shortly, Senator Hollings of South Carolina and Senator Garn of Utah, both involved with financing and overseeing the space program in a month. Mr. Allen and Mr. Yardley, thank you very much for coming in to talk with us today. Pleased to have you with us. Mr. Mr. Allen is in Houston and Mr. Yardley in St. Louis. Here with us are George Will of ABC News and Sam Donaldson, ABC News White House correspondent. Now, a question for both of you. Mr. Allen, first, for no particular reason. From what you have heard from the investigation so far and from your own knowledge and your own background and experience, what, uh, what is your best estimate at this time of what went wrong? Mr. Allen? Mr. Uh, Mr. Brinkley, I... Uh I don't uh, as yet know what went wrong. I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting the final report of the commission, uh, a report that I'm, I know will be given to the president, the Congress, and made public. And I'm awaiting a final report from Dick Truly within NASA, who is newly named to look at uh, the same problem, and then, then we'll know. Mr. Yardley, what are your thoughts on this at uh, this time? I agree with Joe, <clears throat> although there's very strong evidence that something went wrong with the uh, seal on the solid motor. However, that could be many things. And it's not necessarily this temperature problem, although that could be. Just well, let me, ask, let me ask this question here, because I've been wondering about it. If O-rings and the seals and so on are and perhaps have been a problem, why can't those sections be welded together and eliminate this problem altogether? Mr. Allen, why? You know? Uh, uh, John, that sounds like a question for you. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, well, of Is course, there any technical reason why that can't be done? You have, you'd have to weld them at the Cape right. with live propellant in it, which sounds like a very dangerous operation. Plus, that would mean throwing them away, because in order to ship them back to Thiokol to be reused, you have to take it apart. You just can't ship those rockets in a, in a total uh, length. Mr. Yardley, uh, without going on more into the technicalities of O-rings and all the rest, what has struck a number of people listening to the hearings is that the failure was less technical than managerial or even political. As you've listened this week, have you been startled by what you've heard about who gets listened to and who knew what when and who didn't tell what to whom? That's a difficult question <clears throat> because I haven't heard the questions asked that I would ask. What is so that? Let me, let me explain that. I wouldn't be asking who said what to who. I'd be asking, could it have been the, the temperature? What do we know about those joints? I understand it's been four years since the first sign of distress. If NASA is doing the normal thing NASA does, they would have analyzed, tested, and had a whole set of criterion for what is an acceptable joint. Those criterion would have been translated into launch go, no, go conditions. Now, if that happened and the particular criterion that had been debated and settled on was still being met, then I can understand why they felt no, no need to carry that decision on up. But clearly, uh, criteria were uh, used, held up against this launch, and a number of people in a position to know said, do not launch. And the question is, why did they go ahead? Well, the official launch rules probably didn't have anything in it that would prevent this launch. Because if they wanted to deviate on an official launch rule, they would have to take it right up to the top. Mr. Allen, let's pursue that for a moment. We already have the testimony from the engineers at the Morton Thiokol that they unanimously, at their level, thought that this launch might be unsafe and recommended that it not be held. We have the testimony from people that uh, another contractor who said they could not guarantee the safety of the launch uh, from another standpoint, uh, the ice on the, on the potential uh, problem there. Why in goodness name would anyone then at that point not carry it forward to the very top people who made the decision? Uh, Mr. Donaldson, that's of course uh, what we don't yet know and what uh, I'm sure will come out of, of the hearings and the commission uh, findings. Uh, I, I agree very much with what uh, John Yardley has said the question is really not so much about the people that uh, were placed in this very difficult uh, position of deciding, but the rules they were given to abide by and why uh, those apparently were not a little bit more specific uh, following uh, what are apparently known problems with the O-rings. Well, let me just pursue that. Uh, Chairman Rogers tried to answer that question in a sense by talking about common sense. He asked them, it appeared to him that taking leave of their common sense, you're not telling me that when you rode the shuttle as an astronaut, you would like to have believed that people didn't use their best judgment and common sense and merely said to you, well, we followed a checklist of rules. That's not sensible, is it? Uh, absolutely not, and I did believe that people had used common sense. Uh, uh, I, I had 100% faith in that. I will say that it is extraordinarily difficult, though, to legislate common sense. Uh, we see examples of that every day, uh, and difficult to write rules that guarantee that. Mr. Yardley, what about that question? What about the common sense of people who make these decisions, as opposed to just falling back on the idea that, well, we followed the checklist? Sam, the decision should have been made a year ago or six months ago, and probably was. Now, somebody may disagree with that decision. I don't know. But to try to change the rules on launch night is very unusual. And, and, and to, if, if somebody's doing it in the opposite direction, certainly you wouldn't want to do it just because of common sense. But I just don't think that, that although you've addressed it, that, that you've gotten certainly through to me on the, on the question of why if two contractors, uh, the engineers of one, the officials of the other, were saying they could not guarantee the safety of this, and in the case of Morton Thiokol, were warning it could be unsafe, why there is a checklist that exists that allows people to make a decision to launch? Well, all I can assume is that the Thiokol people either had not been able to prevail when the launch rules were prepared or had not brought up the temperature in the, uh, the launch rules uh, 
con uh, conference to set those conditions. Mr. Because coming up, there, there was certainly no new data. The fact that the this was a cold day, uh, NASA knows you're going to have cold days. They should have rules to cover all of those days. So it, it's not it, it's unusual to bring that up if you didn't sell a rule on it uh, six months ago or a year ago. It's been four years that they've been wrestling with this. But Mr. Yardley, uh, clearly, clearly the evidence is that there was a tremendous pressure felt, managerial or political, call it what you will, to get this shuttle up, as when the, the NASA man said, when do you want me to launch this? Do you want me to wait till April? Now, isn't that the problem when you have all, uh, all kinds of engineers with technical expertise saying, don't risk it, and someone says, I can't stand the delay? Wasn't that the problem? Uh, I Mr. Well, so. uh, if, I, I, if I could, uh, sure. John, let me, I'll interrupt. Uh, NASA is an agency that grew up with pressure. Uh, it demonstrated, it has demonstrated successfully time after time it can live with pressure. Uh, I object a little bit to, to uh, placing blame on pressure because it's an agency that can handle pressure. The question is not whether it can take the pressure of putting together a scientifically complicated enterprise under pressure, but does it feel budgetary pressure? The shuttle is behind schedule. Graham Rudman and all the rest is bearing down on the space agency. Is it not possible that political managerial calculations entered in here? I, I guess uh, it certainly is possible, and uh, an ultimate uh, decision on the part of the commission should reveal that. I think it's very premature to, to make an interim uh, judgment right now. Mr. Allen and Mr. Yardley, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for yes, coming sir. in today. I've been pleased to hear your views. Coming next, Senator Ernest Hollings, Democrat, South Carolina, senior Democrat on the Senate Committee on Science, Commerce, and Transportation. And shortly, Senator Jake Garn, Republican, Utah, chairman of a subcommittee on space budgets. In a moment. Senator Hollings in Charleston, South Carolina, thank you for coming in. Happy to have you with us today. Good to be with you. Now tell me this, you've heard the hearings, you've uh, talked to a number of people, you are, have been involved in this program one way or another for some time. At this stage, what, is, what are your thoughts on what went wrong? Well, I think we ought to really refine the conclusion that uh, Chairman Rogers has made that the process uh, was flawed. Rather, the process was violated. Uh, it, it was uh, reversed. It, it was overruled. The process was tried and true. And, and let's get to Bob Crippen's statement quoted by Alan MacDonald. He said the entire philosophy was for the first time, for the first time changed rather than the contract to justifying why to fly. He was having to justify why not to fly. So I want to know where's that pressure from? Is it from Congress? Have we been on to the space agency budgetarily? Is it contractor pressure? Is it White House pressure? Is it Pentagon pressure? Somehow this process, tried and true, was violated for the first time. And I think that's the real question. Well, you've raised a lot of questions there about pressure and where it might have come from. Can you right. answer any of them? No, but I've certainly had me about two dozen Sam Donaldsons out <laughs> gumshoeing around and getting me some statements. Now, that's what Chairman Rogers is objected to. He's got 13 commissioners and 12 on the staff, and they're lawyers and staffers and PR people. But I'd have been down there with five people taking the statements at Canaveral and at Huntsville and at Houston and at Brigham City and then all over Washington, from the NASA space headquarters to the Pentagon to the White House. Everyone had an interest in seeing this go that day with Krista McAuliffe. The pressure was building. There isn't any question about it to get it up there. And here comes the contractors, and there's not one single positive pro-launch statement now, that's a good process to be adhered to or obeyed. On the contrary, it was disobeyed and overruled. But, Why? Senator, we already have uh, the statements of the people from Huntsville. Not only did they testify before the commission, but you know the next day, on Friday, they held a news conference to say, in effect, they disagreed with Chairman Rogers, the process is not flawed. It's almost as if the space shuttle had not blown up. Uh, no, so Sam, what, what are you going to get from them? No, that's not the entire... You, you think that's the entire statement from Huntsville? I bet you I can go down there and get five statements contradicting the head of, uh, of uh, Huntsville and all the rest of them. I could go down to the Cape and get contrary statements. Actually, uh, MacDonald spoke out and now has quit his job. Those kind of statements and that kind of evidence is disappearing, and we're not on top of it. Now, well, the gumshoes from Aviation Weekly and ABC, they are up there. Senator, let, let, let me suggest a forum and ask you about this. What about a grand jury? 
a grand jury to check into the possible criminal negligence for indictment and trial of some of these people. Now, I think that would be the wrong course. We're not looking for criminality. We're looking for correction. We're looking for correction. Where does the pressure come from? It could devolve into that, but right at the moment, we ought not to obscure it with everybody clamming up because nobody really wants to send anybody to jail. But I certainly wouldn't have that manager standing around when the contractor comes and says it's unsafe, and he blandly saying, I thought that was just a concern and not an objection. Senator, That's absolute nonsense. And you Senator, don't think there's any possible criminal negligence involved here as the well, law would define it? As well, it would define it in any other case? I don't think, Sam, I'm not going to make that kind of charge. I'm looking for the correction of the process itself. Senator, let's stay with the series of questions you raised about pressure. You mentioned perhaps pressure from the White House. Let's right. bring something out on the, on the floor that's been talked about in Washington rather surreptitiously. And that is, is it possible that there was pressure from somewhere in the White House to get this shuttle up because it would have coincided nicely with the State of the Union address, which was oh, going to refer to it? Yeah, that's been the statement all over Washington, and it ought to be cleared up. In other words, who in the White House was in contact with Canaveral? Uh, how were they in contact? Through Dr. Graham over at NASA or in direct contact? You know, the Sunday before Tuesday, they had the vice president scheduled to be there. They had all the dignitaries. We had, I had school children wired up in South Carolina to watch this particular launch. And so it could have come from the White House to get it up in time for the State of the Union George. message. Excuse on the other hand, it could have come from NASA on the White House, but let's find out from where. Senator and George, just let me just, just say in fairness to the White House, Larry Speaks has attempted to answer that question. He has called uh, that a vicious rumor. He has denied flatly on the public record that anyone at the White House put any sort of overt or any other kind of pressure. Now, I'm not... Uh, Passing well, Sam, I'm not passing on Mr. Speak's statement. I think it ought to be put on the public record here. I think so, too. I agree with you. But then who was in contact? You can't tell me the White House wasn't in contact with that particular launch. What was said, who was called, and when were they called? Because everyone at this particular point at the Cape says, for the first time, the entire philosophy and process was reversed. It was violated. Now, why? Let, let, well, let's, let's ask two other questions questions about pressure. There was a certain inherent pressure in this because Christy McAuliffe was aboard, the school teacher. If she weren't aboard, is it possible they might not have launched? Do you think it's just the fact that there was an element of public relations and show business involved that tipped the scales? That could be. I really don't know. I don't believe any of us know at this point, but I think you're going to have to get a lot of investigators out there taking a lot of statements to clear up those ideas because you can't bring in a Rogers Commission report here and 120 days and then investigate it like we have the Warren Commission for the next 20 years. That's what I don't want to happen. Senator, Senator I, what, bef before our time runs out, you talked, I believe, to Alan McDonald, the Thiokol engineer who said this shuttle should not have been launched. What did he say to you? He said exactly that, and there wasn't any question, there wasn't any mealy mouth talk. He was violently not only opposing it, they went over his head. You see, he was the one who customarily, usually gave the permission. They overruled him and got a written permission for the first time 2,000 miles uprange in Brigham City, Utah. Thereupon, the next morning, Alan McDonald was still objecting even over the written permission given from his company. I thought that was very significant, and he was only asking for four hours to come into the late afternoon where it was originally scheduled for Tuesday afternoon and not Tuesday morning. Who rescheduled it for Tuesday morning and was forcing it to go up that particular morning? Senator, NASA in general, and the space shuttle program in particular, has been under budgetary <coughs> pressure because, in a way, they oversold the shuttle in order to save it when it was under heavy political attack more than a decade ago. Is it possible that in the current budgetary climate, they feel an extraordinary and perhaps irresponsible pressure to keep on a schedule that simply isn't realistic? Yes, it could have been institutional pressure. I've <coughs> said that from the beginning. That's what it appears really to me at this point that it came right from NASA itself, and somehow the other just said, look, here are these cuts coming and everything else like that. In order to go forward and get approval for the space station, we have to get these manned launch flights up there now. We can't have the Pentagon complaining and everything else of that kind. We've got to get ahead of the curve, so to speak, and uh, they could have brought it on themselves. But all of this should be cleared up, not looking around so much for the technical. We all still want to know, but it's quite obvious what has happened down there, and now we want to know why it's happened. Senator Hollings, thank you. Thanks very much for coming in. Yes, sir. <clears throat> coming next, Senator Jake Garn of Utah, Republican, chairman of a subcommittee on space budgets. In a moment. Senator Garn, thanks for coming in today. Thank Please you, David.
Now, you flew in the shuttle a few weeks ago. You are involved in the financing of the space program, and you have heard what the Commission has learned and so on. Tell us at this stage what you think the problem was. First thing I would say, David, I think we need patience. You know, when an aircraft accident occurs, we're content to wait sometimes a year to find out what happened. Here, there's been such eagerness to pounce on it and have an immediate solution. The most important thing is that we find out exactly what happened in detail, fix it, and fly again. The next most important thing is why it happened. That gets to this management discussion you've been talking about. And both of those are important. The most important is what happened mechanically and how do we fix it. I'm very, very concerned about the desire on some to fix blame. But we've got to find a, a scapegoat rather than find out what's wrong. The one thing that I would absolutely reject is pressure. I think the evidence is overwhelming through 24 launches that NASA always had safety first. I was involved in that process in my own flight. Five delays, four of them for safety of flight items, and there was a lot of pressure there. People wanted to say pressure. There was a lot of press attention on my flight. The president was coming down to have dinner with us, with my crew. The night before one of our launches, there was no hesitancy to say, Mr. President, I'm sorry, you can't come, we're not launching. With Bill Nelson's flight, Congressman Nelson, seven delays in January. A lot of press attention with that one. Here with Chris McAuliffe, I was there on Saturday evening when they canceled 10 hours, 12 hours before on the basis of a weather forecast. My own opinion is, wait until morning, look at the weather. Turned out to be a beautiful day, the press was all over me, look at NASA, ah, ha, ha, they canceled. Monday, we had a latch problem, and then by the time they got the latch fixed, we canceled because of 15-mile-an-hour crosswinds. Then on Tuesday, we're supposed to believe that suddenly there was massive pressure. The vice president was coming down on Sunday morning for that launch. So whatever errors in judgment were made in this process of whether they should or not launched, and I happen to believe that information should have been passed all the way to Jess Moore, and let him make the decision or those top management people. But whatever was flawed in the process of that information going up the chain of command, no one will convince me that there was pressure from any place outside or within NASA Why wasn't the that we must launch along, today. Then? Why wasn't the information passed along? Well, I think it should have been, and I can't answer that question of why they didn't. I can't answer the question, Sam, of why Mr. McDonald in his memos of the previous summer, the fire call engineers know me, if they really felt that vitally concerned, forgetting the night before, why didn't they come to me? I would have asked questions. Somebody came and said, look, we really think there's a well, great danger with these you in the loop. You weren't in the uh, line of uh, authority to try to get this information up, Senator. Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I look at budgets. We have to have committee reviews. We have to pass on their budgets. As one who has flown, uh, I think some of those people might have come and said, look, we're not getting the okay, results that we come. like. They came the night before. They argued. They said unanimously at the engineer level, don't launch. Why didn't Sam, you launch? I can't argue with you that point because I've already said that the information should have been passed up, and I don't know why it wasn't. I agree it should have been so that as part of their decision-making process, they could have analyzed that and said, do we go or no go on the basis of that? I have seen that process. I know the people involved. I know many, how many times they've canceled on more minor concerns than this. So I believe that Jess Moore and others, if they had had that information, would not have launched. But we still don't know for sure that it was the O-rings and it was the cold. And that's why I emphasize it is vitally important that we find that out in our investigation. Well, there, there are obviously two lines of investigations. One is hardware and the other is administrative yes. or human. Now, are you satisfied after what you've heard that there are indeed two <coughs> problems here? There's obviously the hardware problem. It blew up. But uh, are you satisfied that there is a human administrative problem here? I am satisfied that there was on this particular flight the indication that the whole process has been flawed through all the launches I don't accept because I've seen that process and how carefully NASA works and how concerned they were about flight safety. But on this launch, yes, I believe that information should have been passed up. As you know, the, the shuttle barely survived the Nixon White House budget process. It passed once in the Congress because one congressman passed by one vote, and one congressman was confused and voted the wrong way, the right way, for those of us who like the shuttle program. Since it is a program that in order to keep its congressional support oversold itself, it's fairly clear, it's not keeping the schedule, it's not as commercially viable and all the rest, uh, 
Is it possible that these people feel vulnerable under a terrific budgetary gun to keep on a schedule that's not realistic? No. No, I don't accept that. And I spent four months there as a payload specialist to watch that process work. Safety was far more important. Plus, I would disagree with you that the uh, shuttle has not moved on. It hasn't kept up with an initial schedule. But that shuttle has been remarkable. What we have learned about this Earth, what we've been able to achieve scientifically, uh, all of that has been well worth it. There is no better bargain we've had about knowledge for the people on the face of this Earth than what we have learned from manned space flight. So even if we're behind, that doesn't disturb me. This is the most technologically complex machine man has ever built. It is an incredible tribute to this country, despite the fact we have not kept up with the flight schedule. Yeah, I understand, but you see, what, what is puzzling here, there's a human drama, and that is something contrary to human nature happened. That is, information, potentially terribly important, got to a certain level and stopped, whereas every human bureaucratic instinct is to pass it along to broaden responsibility for the decision. Why did it get stopped? You must have a theory. I think that they were bound up with not pressure, but rules and parameters. And I think maybe the key is that there wasn't some common sense use, as Roger said. And there should have been within those parameters of rules. And that can be easily corrected. Dick Truly's already working on that. And I'll guarantee you that you'll never have that kind of a process <coughs> flawed again. Well, and that's it? why it is so important that we find out what happened to the shuttle itself. Well, is it a question of changing the rules or changing the people or both? Well, I can't, that's premature to answer that, that question. That's what Dick truly is about, and I'm confident that NASA can correct that process. Senator Garn, thank you. Thanks very much for thank coming you, in, David. giving us your views. For the record, by the way, we asked NASA, we asked the Presidential Investigating Commission, we asked Thiokol and we asked Rockwell to come in today and tell us what they thought, and they all declined. Coming next, our discussion here of one thing or another, or both, and joining us will be Tom Wicker, columnist for the New York Times. In a moment. Well, when we wound up this program last week, the Philippines was in turmoil. The former defense minister and the a general from the Filipino army were in a sort of bunker, I guess you could call it, with one telephone passing <laughs> between them. Uh, Marcos was saying he would never leave, and since then, look what's happened. It's all totally turned around. Marcos is gone. The general is now commanding the army. The other is now defense minister, and Mrs. Aquino is president. Sam, you're at the White House every day. Did our government apparatus handle this well? would you say? I think a lot of people believe that toward the end it did, if you were seeing it in that way, the government apparatus. Well, Clearly toward the very foreign end, policy establishment. this administration kept pushing Marcos and finally gave him a final shove. I think Senator Paul Laxalt deserves some credit because on the phone, he's the guy who said to Marcos, you know, cut and cut cleanly. Uh, the question in Washington is intriguing a lot of us this week is what part of the administration? Because there's a lot of evidence that most of the Reagan administration was working hard to get the mind of Ronald Reagan on this policy, as hard as it was working on, on getting Marcos out there, because I think Mr. Reagan came long and last to the view that Marcos had to leave. And there's a story at the White House, which I have not been able to confirm, but on this round table, I, I've been told by one person, that Marcos tried to get through to the president, but he didn't, because some of Mr. Reagan's staff said, we, we don't want to let Marcos get through to the president. It just might complicate things. George, any thoughts on this? Well, let's not be grudging. It seems to me that this worked out. The result is what counts, and the result is what the administration wanted and seems to have been correct. Part of this, we have to understand, is that the Philippines has a special relationship with the United States. We had last week on this show a representative of the Marcos administration who was watching part of our show from in the green room, or guest wait. And while we were talking with these men who were committing mutiny and taking time out in the middle of the mutiny to do American talk shows, we asked the question, will the soldiers fire on the civilians? And they said, no. This man in the green room said, well, now that's interesting. General MacArthur fired on the bonus marchers here in Washington. Knew a lot of American history. General MacArthur, of course, is, a, is an enormous figure in Philippine history. So this, this, the, our two countries are tangled up in a very interesting way, and it turned to work out very well for the Philippines that they are. So. Yes, I, I think that um, it was crucial for the uh, Reagan administration to keep the 
pressure that it did uh, on President Marcos. It's hard for me to believe, given his past history, and despite some of the uh, cleaning up that uh, some people are trying to do about him now, it's hard for me to believe that he would have left so uh, painlessly, so to speak, without any more of a struggle, unless he had known it was absolutely hopeless. That, and the only way he could know that was if he was certain the United States was not, was not going to back him. Well, so I think that, that resolution in the last few days, there, particularly after what uh, George refers to as a mutiny, uh, it seems to me that that was particularly important in uh, the departure of Marcos. Well, that was last week. Now it's this week, and Mrs. Aquino is president. And the Philippine Republic's problems are enormous. It's deeply in debt. There is deep-seated corruption. There is poverty. There is unemployment. There is crime. There is a communist insurgency. Is she going to be able to deal with all of that? Well, you, in one week, obviously, it's too early to know, and she is certainly inexperienced uh, in government, although she turned out to be a pretty good politician. But I think the first signs are hopeful. First, in the first place, she obviously has enormous public support. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, upsurge of support for her. Secondly, I thought that the move, apparently against some of her advice, to uh, release everyone from prison, including some who were uh, <coughs> communist leaders, was a good one because her real problem is not simply to keep a few agitators in prison, but to win the general support of the Philippine populace, even out in the out islands where the uh, insurrection is taking place. And I thought that was a good first move, and it also showed uh, considerable resolution on her part because uh, she apparently did that over the advice of some of her... I, I, I agree. I think we have a, already a lesson in the Philippines from years past. Ramon Magsasay, a former president who was killed, I think, in a helicopter crash, had, had a huck of revolution against him, communists, and it was really a major insurgency. Now, the army fought it, but the way he really put it down was by his own reforms and by his administration in Manila. In other words, good government, it seems to me, is the best counteraction to a communist insurgency. Well, it certainly won't necessarily put down an insurgency of this kind, but it would deprive it, at best, one might hope, of the, uh, uh, of the popular support in which it can flourish. Well, I don't think anyone would argue that Mrs. Aquino is a very well-intended and a very nice woman. But is the... What do you mean by that? I mean... I mean just that. That's what I mean. <laughs> Does she have any other attributes? Um, I wasn't through, Sam. Is the governmental apparatus, does it exist in the Philippines to deal with their problems? I say I'm, no one has any doubts about her, hmm. but is the establishment there to deal with well, them? Bring, I, yes, I wonder. Bringing down a government uh, is difficult, though it is, and she was very skillful in this. and Could have stepped wrong in a variety of places, but yellow ribbons will not govern that country. She'll get, they're going to need a lot of help. Now, I hate to be, as I obviously am, a Graham Redmond obsessive, but there comes a point where you might want our country to say, we're going to give you a lot of help. You did the right thing. Everyone's behaving well. We're going to give you a lot of money. Can't do that stuff anymore. What we've done now with Graham Redmond is put the government in a kind of straitjacket, which in foreign aid, either in the Middle East or in the Philippines or who knows where else, is going to limit severely the power of this country. I mean, when you, when you try and have a tiny government at home, you're going to have tiny influence abroad at certain points. But here again, uh, George, the, 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 just the, the backing of the United States is very important. For example, she's demanded the resignation of all members of the Supreme Court in the Philippines who were Marcos appointees, and obviously who could frustrate her very badly uh, if they remain in office. Now, it seems to me that it isn't money that's required here for things like that, but the continuing resolution of the United States government that they're behind uh, Aquino. They're not for a restoration of Marcos. They want her to be able to rule. They want her to, her to be able to govern that country sensibly. I think that's far more important at this point than money, although certainly sooner or later on the economic One of the things we've done that. this week is change our stance about Marcos's loot that he may have brought out on those airplanes when he left. Our first position was that U.S. law would govern, which seemed to suggest that he could keep it and now we've changed it to the position that Philippine law as well as international law would be considered. So it may wind up in the courts, certainly, but eventually some of that money may go back to the Philippines. That's yes. the kind of backing that's important, too. Well, I would like to take a hard right or left, I don't know which turn here, and change the subject quite radically and get into a, the American baseball major leagues and the use of drugs. Peter Ubera, commissioner of baseball, suspended or fined or both 11 players this past week because they were using drugs. Now, why is drug use so common in sports? George, you're a baseball fan. Well, uh, let's put an asterisk over that. It's not quite proven that it's more uh, common in sports than among lawyers, stockbrokers, but a lot of very young kids suddenly start making a great deal of money 
and people who have things to sell, including white powder, come around and see them. There also is the problem, and you see it increasingly in sports, of a use of chemicals, steroids, and other things to produce a kind of competitive edge. And believe it or not, some ball players evidently sincerely believe that they will play better with this, this added advantage as they think of it. Uh, I think the, the problem is going down, uh, is declining considerably, in part because the addictive, the severe addictive nature of cocaine has now become, become apparent. Yes, I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I certainly approve of the asterisk because we know that cocaine is a very widespread problem in our society. And it is not at all proven to me that baseball players, despite the uh, uh, very real problems that George produces here, that they are more uh, prone to that than anyone else. And in, indeed, I think most of the testimony is that uh, cocaine addiction or use in sports is going down. Now, here's a player, for example, like uh, Hernandez of the Mets, who has given up the use of cocaine without going to any drug rehabilitation facility and apparently has not used that for two or three years, has played very well. He's being fined for that, fined over, uh, over uh, $100,000. It seems to me people ought to be encouraged to do that, to come forward. And I think if you feel that you're going to be fined 10% of your salary, you're less likely to come forward and say, gee, I've got a problem here. Could I speak to the other side of that? Sure. I'm interested in what... Uh, the re general reaction has been to Peter Uberoth's uh, discipline of these players. He's been widely praised for doing something. A few years ago, a man in Virginia was sentenced to 40 years in prison for the possession of nine ounces of marijuana. Lamar Hoyt, a baseball player from San Diego, has checked himself into a drug clinic. ABC News was told last week, and I think it's been confirmed, that he was actually stopped on the border by DEA agents and had in his possession some quantity of a number of drugs. So I'm not quite clear why some people ought to be sent to jail for possession of marijuana, cocaine, and other drugs. And in other cases, and here's one, not the only one, people are slapped on the wrist or it's said to be a great thing if they give up one-tenth of their salary. I think we've got to, as a society, decide that we're going to punish the use of drugs by jail and fines for everyone. But that's, well, we're not. That's the good. And baseball players ought not to be exempt from jail if they do something which the average citizen gets thrown in the poker. Well, they for. haven't been. Several baseball players have gone to jail, and I don't mean to defend them uh, as against any other class. I think people ought to be treated alike. But in this case, you have a sort of a <coughs> private system of fines and penalties uh, rather than a general uh, use of the laws to try to prevent and, and punish this sort of thing. But the, That's what, what was it happened in St. Louis for the well, baseball team? Whitey Herzog, the manager of the Cardinals, is sometimes a rather spacious speaker. Doesn't get everything perhaps quite right, but he did say the following thing. He said, he used to take his baseball team in on the day of the game in Montreal. That way I knew we'd played decent, his grammar not mine, for one night, even though the rest of the trip might be a lost cause. One day in Montreal, our pitcher hit an expo the guy who might have been the biggest dealer in the league with a pitch. One of my own infielders comes in and chews out our pitcher on the mound because he's afraid the drug dealer is going to get beaned. <laughs> Clearly, there was a problem, and what's good about this is that Uberoff and baseball has acted against the consumer. So what if about you keep chasing suppliers, you'll never solve the problem, and it's the consumer who is the problem. Well, well I'd only raise the problem. He said that used to be the case in Montreal. <clears throat> now, Herzog went on in that same story to say this is th the situation was worse then. It's declined. I understand. Now, now, what baseball has done, they moved to clean up their image after all this broke into the headlines. They weren't doing anything about this at that time, and yet they knew about it on Her Herzog's own testimony. Yeah, but here was this case where the drug dealer goes on trial but all of the people who got the drugs from him are exempt from indictment and trial. Is that equal justice? No, we'll, have, we'll have to let that question hang for another time, Sam. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Hanging we'll be back with a few words about Ferdinand Marcos and all that money he brought out, and whose money was it? Maybe ours, in a moment. To all you students of innovation, to you inspired to try what's never been tried before, to all those consumed with an insatiable curiosity, a penchant for ingenuity. To you who seek and search and blaze new trails, who try and fail and try again. To all you children of imagination, 
You sons and daughters and mothers of invention, dreamers and doers, thinkers and tinkerers all, we at General Electric salute you. For as advanced as our technology has become, we've never forgotten that from small beginnings, big ideas grow. Finally, Ferdinand Marcos may not have been the worst national leader ever forced out of office. There are many contenders for that honor, but he may well have been the richest. When he arrived in Hawaii, he had piles of cash, jewelry, all kinds of valuables, and there were papers showing that he seemed to own some office buildings in New York worth hundreds of millions. Members of Congress tell me that his, he owns assets of more than a billion dollars, and so does his wife, a billion or more. Well, there is not much doubt that a lot of this is money from American taxpayers sent to the Philippines in the form of aid, one kind or another, and nobody aided except the Marcoses and their cronies. In the future, however, it may be difficult to persuade dictators to step down from office if they know all their money is going to be taken away from them. Look at Jean-Claude Duvalier, who is now living in a luxury hotel in France, having lobster for breakfast and bed. How much other American aid money sent to the third world countries is stolen before it ever reaches the people it is supposed to help? A lot. For all of us at ABC's This Week, until next Sunday, thank you. From previous shuttle flights showed burn damage on 12 occasions. Flight safety has been and is being compromised by potential failure of the seals, said one memo dated last July, and failure during launch would certainly be catastrophic. According to spaceflight experts, the evidence suggests that, in fact, is what happened to Challenger. Clearly, the joints are the weakest link in the entire system because those simply have these plastic pressure seals rather than solid steel. And if they should fail? Uh, if these seals fail, uh, you could have an accident such as we just had. This is the problem area that worried the NASA engineers, the seams between the rocket's four main sections. When the sections are locked together before flight, they're supposed to be sealed completely by what are called O-rings, something like giant washers, two for each seam. Last week, NASA publicly admitted that these seals have been troublesome. We have seen some evidence of what we call uh, blow by those seals, some erosion of those seals. Was we, that any cause for concern? Oh, yes. I mean, yeah, that, that's an anomaly, and that was thoroughly worked, and that's uh, completely documented. What the space agency hasn't said so far is what it did, if anything, about the problem. And that is raising troublesome questions. With a problem like this, I don't think they should have been flying the shuttle until they had fixed it. The NASA memo suggests the space agency was worried about the cost of fixing the problem with the SEALs, calling it a budget threat. The special presidential commission examining the space shuttle disaster wants these questions about the memos answered quickly. Its chairman asked for all the documents today. The full commission will examine them in a closed session tomorrow and hold a public hearing on Tuesday. Robert Shackney, CBS News, Washington. Information it has on the seals of the shuttle's booster rockets. This after the New York Times reported today that NASA officials had been warned last summer in internal memos that flight safety was being compromised by potential failure of the seals. Said one memo, failure during launch would certainly be catastrophic. A commission spokesman, Mark Weinberg, said a public hearing on the SEAL question will be held on Tuesday.